This is Binghamton Now on News Radio 1290, WNBF Binghamton, and WNBF.com. I'm Bob Joseph. This is Binghamton Now for Tuesday, August 13th, 2024. Live on 92.1 FM, 1290 AM. Online at WNBF.com. This is your program. We're here till noon. WNBF! 607-772-1290. That's our number. Thank you for being with us. Hope you're able to spend the next few hours learning a few things about what's going on in the Binghamton area and beyond. Contributions as in phone calls and emails, are always accepted. 607-772-1290 is the number. That's the Binghamton Now hotline. And our email address is bob at wnbf.com. Big announcements about the future of the former Oakdale Mall in Johnson City. Housing will be a key component. I expected this to happen. Not exactly this building with 125 units, but something like it. And so they uh, have now officially announced that an apartment building, the rendering shows a four-story complex with apparently 125 units. So if you want to live at the Oakdale Commons and be close to health care and craft beer production. That might be the place for you. They also are planning to add a 200 space child care facility and a medical complex. State will be uh, providing up to $18 million in funding for the next phases of the work at Oakdale Commons, if you'd like to see more about what is planned for the next two or three years in Johnson City, I would recommend that you take a look at our website, WNBF.com. Always the place for local news and original reporting. Speaking of some original reporting, another update story we continue to follow. The upgrades at Grippen Park and West Endicott continue. They're raising the roof. A new roof is being put on the structure at Grippen Park in the town of Union. And um, the place is being transformed. They also have started doing some excavation for uh, some of the other amenities that will be coming to Grippen Park in the coming months. So a substantial amount of work has happened. And more to come. We'll continue to follow the progress. That's a $4.3 million park improvement project. We've been talking with County Executive Jason Garner about that frequently over the last year or so. As far as uh, other things of interest, well, of course, New York State continues to operate the way it always does. And Even the federal government is operating pretty much the way it always does. 914 at News Radio, WNBF. By the way, we don't mention it that often, but I would encourage you to check out our Twitter feed, at Binghamton Now. Some people know Twitter by a different name, but I like the original name, so if you want to call it something else, you are welcome to, but we are on the social media platform formerly known as Twitter. So, twitter.com slash Binghamton now, or if you're already on Twitter or whatever he's calling it, definitely follow Binghamton now for late news and more. After uh, a string of less than optimal weather around here, we now are getting a few really, really nice days. 
in the Binghamton region. Now, you know, some people say, yeah, we're going to pay for this. Well, you could also say we paid for it last week with all the heat, humidity, and uh, frequent storms. So no matter how you look at it, the weather is always going to change. We right now, though, are fortunate to have a nice, calm weather pattern. So I'm going to enjoy it while it lasts and not worry about what's around the corner because, of course, when it comes to the weather machine, you can't, you can't fix it, you can't change it. So let's take a look at, at one of the better weather forecasts we've seen of late. Mostly sunny today, high 77, mainly clear tonight, low 56, mostly sunny tomorrow. Isolated showers in the afternoon, maybe a thunderstorm or two late in the day. High tomorrow, 79, and the outlook for Thursday, sunny. The chance of showers and thunderstorms in the afternoon, high 83 right now. It's 66 at WNBF. If you know, you know. Otherwise, you're saying, why isn't it WNBF? 66 WNBF degrees. 19 Celsius, 34 AQI, air quality index. And air quality is pretty good, clean, refreshing. It's 917 at News Radio, WNBF. What will happen today? The reality is, at this hour of the day, who knows? Who really knows? Anything, anything can happen. Any, any weekday, even on the weekends now, they sometimes give us unscheduled things with breaking news. So... We encourage you to pay close attention to WNBF using the free WNBF app. And also, we mentioned about WNBF.com earlier as far as with the news information. We also have uh, plenty of other things going on at WNBF.com, including some money-saving deals. Check out Seize the Deal. Plenty of uh, things that are available for you at substantial savings. Substantial. So check it out, WNBF.com. Morning, WNBF. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Ah, still water in the lines from last week? I thought, I thought they got the water out of the lines. But <sighs> it only... You see, the way the lines work these days, lines don't work the way they used to. The way the lines work these days, you get a little water in them. It might take weeks or months before it all evaporates. Hi, you're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Binghamton. It's John. Morning, John. You sound a little down. Bob, I'm a crime victim. What happened? Well, on J Street, on... Saturday, I was at the St. Mary's Bazaar, and uh, the car known as Old Vic was keyed. Your personal vehicle, your private John Mobile, was vandalized? Yes, 77,000 miles in perfect condition. The Patriot edition of the Crown Victoria, the Patriot edition. So that makes it even worse. It's bad enough if it was the regular edition, but the Patriot edition also suggests the perpetrator may have something against America. I would say so, yeah. So uh, I hope that the city can use my plight and uh, get a government grant out of it. Well, they might have a task force. You know, uh, Tish James may have a, a task force that would select five or six upstate cities for grants of Five hundred or seven hundred thousand dollars for a, a task force, an anti keen task force. And she would hold a news conference. She might hold it uh, on J Street. She might request that you bring your car back to the place where it was parked for the St. Mary's event. And she might kick off her new anti keen campaign right here in Binghamton. Well, I, I think what I'm going to do is get these people that tape weddings, you know, to 
every time I park the car, they, they can come and, you know, stand by it and run their cameras. And I'll have a VHS tape of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, better yet. Why don't you, if you really, if you want to really prove you're serious, make sure they record it on a beta tape. Yeah. <laughs> I am serious, you kids. Yeah. And you kids, stop damaging my beautiful Patriot vehicle. Yeah. So, uh, oh my. you know, uh, I was in Vestal yesterday, and uh interesting thing developing there, I guess, is the uh, residence in uh, a five-story, 312 unit apartment building instead of the residence in with only a couple of 215 or so spaces, four bedroom apartments, studio apartments. So uh, the population of Vestal is, uh, if these apartments come online in Bun Hill, it's going to increase. So that's, uh, that's good. It'll help you know, spread out the uh increased tax bill over more people so that means the impending tax hikes will be not not nearly as hard for current residents to have to process well, i i don't think um i think the public when they brought the emts on that that wasn't explained properly uh to the to the public and and this is the last chance for the Vestal residents to just tell the board outright, if you vote, if you cannot live within your means and vote for the tax increase, you, you will never be uh, considered for political office in Vestal. Again, I don't no think matter. they care. I, I am under the impression, and I'm not going to go into detail at the moment, I've come to the conclusion the people who run Vestal now, or in the last, we'll say, decade, in the end, they don't really care. Well... I think their actions demonstrate beyond a reasonable doubt they don't care. They're not accountable. Well, well, you know, there, there's uh, the, the big retailers, the commercial real estate, uh, you know, they uh, play hardball with their assessments. And the poor residents, a lot of them just take it lying down. But I think Vestal's a place where it's a tale of uh, two two uh, two groups. One is the you know the well healed medical. Well, it's sort profession. of it's a microcosm of America. It's well, uh, the town of Vestal. You've got the the elites who include the town leaders and the. I'll just say financially very well off, and then you have the rest. I don't know if you would divide it, if it's 95% of the people are are like you and me, then there's the 5% elite. But anyway, appreciate your call, John. Thanks. I, uh, yeah, I, I had hope. I had hope for the town of Vestal several months ago. <laughs> but... As they say, actions speak louder. It's Bob Joseph live on a Tuesday morning. This is Binghamton Now on WNBF 27. We're joined by Karen Sweet O'Neill. The preview of tomorrow's informational segment here on WNBF. And this update is sponsored by KSO Insurance Solutions. Good morning. Good morning, Bob. How are you? Never better. I was out in the Vestal District today uh, enjoying a cup of coffee and just assessing. I made some assessments of what uh, is really going on in Vestal. I was, uh, I was amazed by a couple of things I saw. Mm-hmm. There's a lot going on in Vestal. <laughs> there is more than meets the eye, <laughs> if you know what I mean. I do. I do. Yes. So we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about tomorrow from Vestal. And that is um, the Inflation Reduction Act and how it's going to pertain to people that are on Medicare in 2025. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, Bob, what it did, one of the things that it did, one of the provisions of the act was that there would be a cap on out-of-pocket um, 
out-of-pocket prescription copay drug costs for people that are on Medicare, and it would be capped in 2025 at $2,000, which is a pretty, pretty big deal. But what we're going to focus on is can that affect your employer-sponsored coverage? So some people that are 65 or older, whether they're working or they're the younger, the younger one that's not and their spouse is 65 or older and they're Medicare eligible, but they decide to keep their work insurance, their employer coverage, because it's just more cost effective until um, that person retires. These people are going to need to pay attention because the $2,000 out-of-pocket cap is going to have to meet the employer-sponsored coverage, or the employer-sponsored coverage is going to have to meet that to make it what they refer to in the government as credible coverage. So we're going to get into it a little bit deeper tomorrow and why it's real, real important to pay attention um, because if it isn't deemed credible coverage, then the people that are Medicare eligible under work insurance or the spouses will need to get prescription drug coverage on the outside to avoid penalty enrollment. So it's a pretty big deal. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow. We are at 1708 Vesto Parkway East, up above Plato's Closet and Style Encore. You can reach us several ways for an appointment. You can simply give us a call at 607-772-4898, or you can Google us at KSO Insurance, and all our contact information will come up, including our website. And if you missed the phone number, we have a big display ad under insurance in the yellow pages. I'm looking forward to the live segment tomorrow. Very good. Hey, enjoy this beautiful day, Bob. You as well. Thanks, Karen. You bet. Bye. 930 WNBF Binghamton, 607-772-1290. We'll take calls. I encourage people to call every day, once a day. Having said that, one thing that occurs to me, is <laughs> never mind. There's there's a, a separate show being done in the pro in, in the studio as well. But that, that's a different story. For purposes of Binghamton now, as we focus on the most important show in the studio. If um, yeah, if you want, just call us. <laughs> Hey, when they come in and, and try to distract you, just ignore them. 607-772-1290. And by the way, if you ever see a crash or any kind of delay, you can let us know by sending a message through the WNBF app. Morning, WNBF. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Mayor Bob from Busto. Good morning, Robert. Uh, I just went for a walk and I got my truck to come home. I heard you and that John talking about Vestal. And us people in Vestal are getting real tired of you cutting us down. I haven't cut yeah, Vestal do. down. When's the last time I cut Vestal down? Everybody's rich. And, uh, uh, no, they're not. No, I said it's basically my <laughs> estimate was 95% are people like you and me, and then there's the 5%. To, for which money is no object. So, no, uh, virtually all Vestal residents are are good people, people like you and me who have to watch our budgets, and then there's 5%. And I'm not jealous. I'm, I'm proud that Vestal has so many well-off residents, but they don't care if the tax rate is doubled or tripled because they have the money to pay it. You, on the oh, other wait. hand, Bob... Bob, Roberts, you? listen carefully. You, on the other hand, if they raise your property taxes the way they plan to, you might be upset. What a filibuster. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. It's just, it never ends on here. You know what? It's, you know what? I'm, I'm looking out for you. You I'll and other, other, other Vestal residents who can't afford these tax increases. <sighs> now, hey, if, well, now... You're the one who calls in complaining about high prices, the high price of food or the high price of gasoline or whatever. And now you're going to imply you don't care that they're going to raise your taxes? 
listen, I don't like you, and I don't like you cutting down my town. Get it right. I went to a thing for a guy the other day, a memorial, a great bass player from this area that died. And I tell you, it was mostly Vestal people, and you were not well-liked in Vestal. I heard so many people go, what is wrong with that guy? By the way, I must respond. In your circle, I'm not surprised you surround yourself by a bunch of nattering nabobs of negativism because like-minded people attract each other. I get it. So, of course, your core group of friends and acquaintances... Of course, they're not, and first, they're not going to say, even if they love the host of this program, they're not going to admit it to you. They don't want to start a fight, especially after they're trying to uh, remember a dearly departed loved one. The vast majority of people in Vestal, and I can attest to this because I was in Vestal just an hour ago talking with people in Vestal, and they told me how much they love me and the show. Oh, God. Okay, this was not... My nattering nabobs. This was people from teenagers to old 70-some-year-old people. We are celebrating this great guy that was a musician in this area for years. I'm just saying a lot of people come up to me because they go, Bob from Vestal, and they go, what in the heck is that guy thinking? I go, I don't know. He loves these people that are, yeah, you're talking about me bitching about high prices. Well, what about, maybe I'd have money for more taxes if your buddies weren't raising prices there on everything. You're liberal friends. You don't get it, do you? You just keep this roundabout, oh, yeah. I mean, there was a coup. Joe Biden got 14 million votes, and now they just told him, you're out of here. You think that's right? You're yeah, probably- yes. Thankfully, the Democrats decided that there was a person who's better suited to be president for the next four years, and certainly someone who stands a real chance. In fact, most Americans agree she stands an incredibly good chance of defeating this guy. That's why the Democrats did what they did. The Democrats did what they had to do, and that's that's what makes the Democrats so beloved by most Americans. That's why there are more registered Democrats in America than registered Republicans. Bob, you know that. You are a commie, man. Kamala Harris. What? She didn't even get... I'm not a commie, man. Don't you ever call me man. Yes, she is. When she was in California, she couldn't even win her own state. And now she's... Okay, let me tell you who they're telling her she is. Winston Churchill, Golda Meir, and Albert Einstein rolled into one. And you believe it! And Beyonce, and Taylor Swift, and AOC. She's everything to everyone. Man, I hope some people that are on my side call and just rip you. You are. Oh, the people on your side aren't even going to call because they're too busy crying in their porridge. You you whine every day about everything and then call everybody else. You Binghamton people. How you Don't you dare guy? say anything against Binghamton people. Man, we no, are man, Binghamton. We are the parlor city. We are Binghamton strong. You are an idiot, Joseph. Name in your real name, but we won't go there. Uh, all right, now I'm going to gonna be a- okay. You want me to call the medics to provide I, I assistance or counseling? Days, I swear. Why don't you retire and go to Fenway Park or something? I told you that. I would love to spend the rest of my life at Fenway cheering on the Red Sox. A good baseball team, unlike the Yankees. Do it. Well, see that? There you go. You live in New York. You're from the Boston Red Sox. You you can't go out for a beer. You drink Moxie. You're just a strange person. I cannot. I'm strange, but I'm not weird. Get off my phone. Thank you, Bob, for the call. It's always inspiring to hear from our fan base in Vestal. It's 938 with Bob Joseph on your side, working for all, truth, justice, and the comics. 607-772-1290 is the number. And remember, you can always listen to us using the free WNBF app. Joined now in the studio with uh, Alexis Bluse and Madeline Robinson from Truth Farm. Good morning. Welcome to WNBF. Good morning. morning. Thank you for having us. And thank you for coming in from all the nice weather to enjoy the beauty that is 
a radio studio surrounded by tons of concrete, glass, and steel. Mm, yeah, it was tough. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I won't keep you too long, but you have some uh, information to share with our audience about uh, an event that will be coming up in a few days. Yeah, we do. So uh, I think a lot of our community knows who Truth Farm is. We're an organization that helps raise awareness about the overdose epidemic. Uh, And every year we have an event called the Trail of Truth, uh, which we started in 2016. So this is our ninth year hosting the Trail of Truth. And it's a memorial event in honor of International Overdose Awareness Day. But we also honor people who've lost their lives due to other substance use related causes. So sepsis, endocarditis, um, not just overdose, because I think a lot of people forget that, that we're losing people to a lot of different um, causes other than just overdose. Uh, And the event is uh, this year, the first time ever going to honor people from all across the state of New York, not just the Southern tier. For our listeners who aren't familiar with the organization, just a a brief brief overview of uh, how and why it was founded nearly a decade ago. Yeah, so I um, lost my son, Jeff, uh, and and you recognize we started the organization nearly a decade ago. Um, I actually just passed the anniversary, the 10th anniversary of losing my son, um, August 5th, 2014. Um, and six months later, I started this organization uh, just, you know, with a real drive and desire to help other families not have this happen to them, um, or if they do have it happen to them, have um, a place to go and a community built that would bring comfort um, to them. So that was the uh, origins of Truth Farm. And I know in the intervening 10 years, sadly, so many additional people have been lost in our communities around the Binghamton area, around New York, around the nation. This has been... It's been a tough decade for the thousands and thousands of lives lost. Yeah, I'm going to hand that one over to Madeline, actually, who's here with me today, because um, I think that people have to remember that, that it's, you know, it's not just something that was happening 10 years ago. Uh, The overdose epidemic continues to rage and... um, Every year we're losing more and more people in the United States and and Madeline is a victim of a recent loss. Certainly, um, I can attest that the opioid overdose epidemic is still rampant um, and still affecting Binghamton and Binghamton community members. Um, I lost my mom to an overdose last year. Um, It's been just a little bit over a year and um, that's how I found myself in the harm reduction field and how I found myself at Truth Farm, um, joining with these other people who have also lost loved ones to make a difference about it and make a change because we don't want this to continue. This can't go on any longer. And I know uh, just from talking to many people over over the last several years on this program and, and just uh, off the air in person, it, it really is amazing the the impact these losses have and the fact that at some point in time you can start to come to terms with the loss but let's face it you ne- never never get over the the pain and asking yourself sometimes a lot of questions what if and why and and so many other things that are are naturally naturally going to occur when we lose someone we love Certainly. So, prior to the loss of your mom, had you thought much about the the issues surrounding the um, the the number of losses in our community, and until it it came so close to have a, a such a close impact on you and in your life? That's a great question. Um, I've always been aware of kind of what's going on in not only the Binghamton community, but in just the world in general. And I've always been aware that substance use is a large issue um, as it does run in my family genetically. Um, However, like it didn't feel like this until after my loss. Um, And, you know, you always think like, 
it's gonna be okay, like there's gonna be more time and then there's not more time. So sometimes um, reality, you just need a reality check and um, having a loss like this is a humongous reality check and um, having that lived experience shows you really the the root of this issue and what we need to do about it and it, it gives you a drive and a motivation to make something different well there's always i think the the goal of trying to help people who are in desperate need of assistance and and certainly people who um sometimes at a minimum just need someone who has some empathy someone who can listen certainly yeah because yeah, after after a loss a lot of times most people don't know the right words and sometimes no words are going to help sometimes just spending time being quiet and listening as appropriate is is perhaps the best we could do yeah that absolutely is. yes so true so let's talk about the event that's coming up so it'll be this saturday yep okay and where so it is uh, this Saturday, and from 2 to 4 p.m. is our Memorial Cemetery, and it's really just beautiful. People, anyone from the community can come and wander through. We really encourage people to do that. Um, there will be 500 tombstones set up in the courthouse, the historic courthouse yard in the downtown Binghamton. It's at 92 Court Street. We have... Um, call your street closed down and we'll have resources and food and shirt sales and um, activities, most importantly activities for families who have lost a loved one. Um, like children can come make a memorial bracelet if they've lost a parent or a family member. Um, families can come and paint memorial stones. Uh, we have grief shared circles. And so like you said, Bob, it's like an opportunity for people to be with people who understand this type of loss. Um, but it's also for the community c to come out and recognize what we're losing, who we're losing, and how big of an impact this is on our community. So 2 to 4 p.m. is the cemetery. Um, 4 p.m. we have speakers and performers come on, um, talk about their lived experience, talk about how we can reduce overdoses in our community, reduce stigma, and support each other. And then we march um, to Holly Street to our governmental plaza and we lay down and have our um, bodies traced, uh, which is just a symbolic um, empowering and healing experience for the family members. Do you have a sense that attitudes have changed over the last decade or so about the, the issues surrounding loss due to uh, overdose? I really do. Um, it's one of the things, uh, you know, passing this 10 year anniversary of losing my son, I do a lot of reflecting and think about, you know, what we have accomplished and what we haven't accomplished. Unfortunately, I tend to be the type of person who really focuses on what we didn't do yet. <laughs> so I have a laundry list of things that I'm disappointed we haven't accomplished in our country yet. Um, however, I really do believe um, that, that we have reduced the stigma both in our community here at home, and I, I would say even especially, like I feel like our community has really become very empathetic and caring about this issue. I very rarely see the comments that I used to see on news stories that would say like, let them die, who cares, you know, you know let weed them out or whatever. I hardly ever see those comments anymore, which I'm so grateful. Um, so I think our community is doing much better in terms of stigma. Um, but it's still kind of a hidden issue when people are going through it. Families still, if they have a loved one struggling with addiction, will keep it a, a secret. And, and people who have addictions who are in professional roles will keep it a secret. Um, and so we have to work on that stigma too. If people want more information about Truth Farm, how can they obtain that? They can call us at 607-296-3016. They can find us on all social media platforms. It's Truth Farm, like Tell the Truth, and P-H-A-R-M. Um, and they could email us if they want at truthfarm at gmail.com. Um, and we would be happy to hear from anyone either interested in the event, attending, volunteering, or just hearing about the types of services that we have to offer the community. Alexis and Madeline, thank you for joining us and 
telling us more about Truth Farm and about this weekend's event in Binghamton. Thank, Thank you, you so you much for, for having, having us. us. <laughs> it's 9.53. We're live and local, serving the community at 92.1 FM, 1290 AM, and always available at WNBF.com. Binghamton now, it's almost mid-August. Where is the summer going? Although, technically, we still have more than a month left of summer, but gee, before you know it, it'll be Labor Day, the kids will be going back to school, and then, of course, you have to start with all your holiday shopping, because if you don't start by... I think the day after Labor Day, you're probably going to miss out on all the choice selections of fine, fine merchandise. Mostly sunny today, high 77, mainly clear tonight, low 56, sunny tomorrow. Isolated showers in the afternoon, even a thunderstorm possible late in the day with a high of 79. And then the extended outlook, sunny Thursday, slight chance of showers and thunderstorms in the afternoon, high 83, partly sunny Friday, high 82. Right now it's 68 in downtown Binghamton. It's 20 Celsius at News Radio, WNBF, WNBF WNBF.com. I will have some really, really interesting stories coming up at WNBF.com. Uh, oh, here's something from someone on Twitter. Marlon. Marlon writes, on your best days, you are a great journalist, Mr. Joseph. On your worst, a political activist. With a couple of emojis. Thank you for hosting a great local show, even though we all know that secretly you wish you were national. Hmm. Hmm. Now, I mean... Would I like the show to be national if I could still host it from this same studio? Okay. Problem is, if this show ever went national, then I would be getting a lot of <clears throat> guidance from people from a syndicator. So I'm not sure I would be happy with it going national. If, if I could be on, like Rush was on, what was Rush on? 7,000 stations. So if I could have Binghamton Now or turn it into USA Now or whatever as a national broadcast and be on 20,000 stations, yeah, I would like it if I could still be here. If they wouldn't tell me a lovely morning in Mr. Joseph's neighborhood, 607-772-1290. If you have some things to discuss, whether it's local, you're looking forward to Ever higher property tax rates with no explanation, no accountability? Is that what you're looking forward to? Well, if that's what you like, you're going to get it. Or maybe you have other thoughts about things going on around the world. Give us a call. Again, the number is 607-772-1290. Hi, WNBF. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Don from Binghamton. Good morning. Welcome to WNBF. First time caller. (laughs) Why are you calling all of a sudden? I take it you've listened to the program for some time. Well, I was playing with the WNBF app and and there's a lot of stuff on there. And I'm like, oh, what does this button do? (laughs) Oh, it calls it calls your line, your your uh, your uh, main line. Directly from the, from the app. app. So you push I've using never... the call button. Yeah. Well, somebody had mentioned to that uh, about it that it, it would work that way. And I was thinking, you know, wouldn't that be great if people could call directly from the app instead of having to remember that long 10-digit number? So, <laughs> and, and you know what? It actually, it's between you and me, it sounds so good. Oh. It sounds great. I like that. Yeah. The yeah. quality is impeccable, as in hard to pack. Well, I worked hard putting that together. All right. <laughs> All right. By the way, Don from Binghamton, it, your voice sounds familiar. You may not have called the program, but I, I get a sense that you're familiar with WNBF and certainly, if nothing else, the 6 to 9 a.m. First News Binghamton slot. Yeah, are, are, are you by any, are you related to that Don Morgan who is the anchor? <laughs> 
Wait a second. Uh, Wait one second. <laughs> All you have to say, well, I am not at liberty to comment on that, Mr. Joseph. Thank you for your question. I'll have my people get back to your people. That's right. Yes. <laughs> well, it sounds so good. And, and again, you're, you're telling me the truth. You're using the WNBF yeah. app to call. Yeah. yeah. Right there, what we call the trending bar. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things on there okay. where uh, you can uh, email us and text us. And um, there's also a call us button. And you just hmm. push that button and it goes right to our to our phone line. See, I you saw, I've seen it on the app, but I never dared to try it. And now I'm, I'm probably inclined to try it with you tomorrow morning to see yeah. if, it, if it'll work even for me, even a, a lowly talk show host. <laughs> All right, Don from Binghamton, a, a real pleasure. I hope you'll call again. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> you, sound, you sound disgruntled. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hope you have a great day. Goodbye, Bob. Don from Binghamton. Which reminds me, Don Morgan bringing you First News Binghamton from 6 to 9 right here on WNBF. All right. Yeah, it's the quality. The quality of that connection was actually stunning. That's <laughs> and people are saying, wait, was that set up? All right, yes, it was set up. I, I asked him to do that. So it was all, all part of the theater of the mind that is WNBF Radio, where we have this theater of the mind, virtual theater in a studio just a little bit bigger than those micro apartments. What else is going on? Oh, everybody's talking. <laughs> Everybody is talking. New York Times says it will stop endorsing candidates in New York races. The paper's editorial board will continue to endorse presidential candidates as it has for more than 160 years. So they made the announcement on Monday. And let me just read a bit here and then I'll offer my thoughts and my perspective so the story, which for some reason they tucked into the business section online and in the print edition, instead of putting this maybe on the editorial page where I think it belongs, so people who read the editorial page all the time would see what's going on. The New York Times editorial board will no longer make endorsements in New York elections, including in races for governor and mayor of New York City, the Times opinion editor said. The change will be immediate. The paper does not plan to take a stance in Senate, congressional, or state legislative races in New York this fall or in next year's New York City elections. Kathleen Kingbury, the Times opinion editor, said in a statement, the Times remained a journalistic institution rooted in New York City. She did not give a reason for the shift, but said that opinion, that's the section, opinion, will continue to offer perspective on the races, candidates, and issues at stake. The Times editorial board, the part of the opinion section that makes the endorsements operate separately from the Times newsroom, the board will continue to endorse in presidential elections as it has since 1860. All right, nobody asked, but I'll just say briefly what I think about this. I think that it's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't go far enough. I think the New York Times editorial board should no longer make endorsements in any political race. And basically, that's what I've thought about newspapers from the first time I read a newspaper. And I understand there's a difference between news stories and opinion. I get that. Of course I get it. <laughs> but I just think, especially now, with newspapers being hmm, endangered, because there are fewer and fewer newspapers in America than ever before, I think it's time for all newspapers, if they purport to be independent news operations, I think they should stop with the endorsements. They can still provide opinions, and they will on their editorial pages. But as far as endorsing candidates in local or state or national races, I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think it's necessary. 
I think if if the New York Times editorial board or columnists or the people invited to write op-ed pieces, I think if they want to express opinions, they can do that. I don't think there's a need. I don't think there's an overwhelming demand, except for certain candidates, that newspapers offer endorsements. So, yeah, my take is New York Times, okay, good. You're not going to endorse in New York races. What about New Jersey races? <laughs> or Connecticut races? Now, bottom line is just stop endorsing candidates, but still express opinions if you want in your opinion section. People can decide. As people will note, in many cases, the editorial side of a newspaper provides generally, not totally, but generally unbiased coverage of actual news stories. They strive to be generally balanced. And then the opinion section offers opinions, but I don't think endorsements are needed. It's 1019 at WNBF. Good morning. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Good morning, Bob. This is Bonnie from the South Side. Hi, Bonnie. How are you? Great. What's up? Hey, I wanted to just go over one item from Project 2025. Um, I grew up in a time when women had rights and choices. I could get a great education. In fact, I have multiple degrees. Um, and where our history was respected, both good and bad. And women had the opportunity to vote. And women could make their own choices. It was a time when neighbors minded their own business. But in Project 2025, the path to abolishing no-fault divorce, um, a woman's right, is on the path to being abolished. Remember, our no-fault uh, no divorce had been signed into law by Ronald Reagan. Today, if... Um, today, or if Trump is elected, it goes away. Um, and I want to just talk about no-fault divorce being more beneficial for women as it provides an easier path to ending marriage. So since 1969, studies have shown that no-fault divorce correlates with a reduction in female suicides, an 8 to 16% reduction. It's a reduction in partner violence. 30% reduction, a 10% drop in the women being murdered by their husband. And so my question is, why wouldn't we want our wives, our mothers, our daughters, our granddaughters, our nieces, all of them, to have the same opportunities that I had growing up? So for those of you out there that don't believe in a woman's right, mind your own damn business. We can make our own choices and stop this insanity. All of you should be voting for Kamala Harris. Do you think this will be a critical issue or perhaps the singular overriding issue for uh, many women in November? I think women's right is going to be the key issue in November. All of them. The right to make our own choices. The right to not have our votes taken away. The, the right to, um, um, to, to continue to have no-fault insurance uh, or no-fault divorces. And in and, and here, and it doesn't just have to be a national issue. For those of you who don't recognize that, when Mark Molinaro got into office, he voted to pass his first, one of his first acts was voting to pass anti-choice legislation. Um, and... Um, he also voted um, to allow um, doctors to be criminalized here in New York. So it's not just a national issue, it's a state issue as well. I think it's critical that women get out there and vote. I appreciate your call. Thank you. 1022 WNBF with more calls more often. Hi, what's... Uh What's on your mind? What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Hey, Bob. This is DJ in Binghamton. Good morning. How are you doing? Great. Well, I don't know if you guys heard on the radio last night or this morning that um, Kamala Harris has turned 
MAGA because now she wants pro fracking, pro border, and no tax on tips. Sure. Of course she's going to be MAGA. She wants to be president. Yeah. So, the so there's nothing, nothing wrong with her adjusting her views similar to what Donald Trump has done in recent decades. You look at historically at Mr. Trump's views over the years, they were a lot different than his publicly expressed views today. So, yes, I would say virtually all candidates or all offices eventually uh, adjust their publicly expressed views if they are looking for votes. Well, so the lady who just spoke, I said, vote for Kamala. They are. They're voting for President Trump. Well, hey, people can vote who they want for. You know, maybe, maybe some women who like his style, like his personality, like what he has said about how he treats women, maybe they'll be inclined to vote for him. It's a free country. And in the end, we have a secret vote. So it's always possible, even some women who call in the program to publicly express support for Kamala Harris, it's always possible that eventually when they have the opportunity to cast a secret ballot, that they'll wind up voting for Donald Trump because there's just that je ne sais quoi that, that makes them think he would be the greatest president. Well, we all know... Uh that he treats women better than any, any president in my lifetime. His daughter. Was a <laughs> no, we don't. We don't know that. We we do know some of the things we have on tape. Just ask Billy Bush. But it could be AI. But it wasn't. That was before AI was a thing. And look, if it was AI, you can bet that Melania and Donald Trump would have said right at the outset, as soon as that recording was released that it was not actually what he said and neither melania trump nor donald trump nor anybody with the trump organization ever questioned its veracity you can tell by a man's daughter and wife his daughter was the greatest model most famous model who ever lived his wife is miss Uni was ran for miss universe but anyway that's not why i called i called to ask you why didn't you ask john if he had uh, vandalism insurance. If he had vandalism insurance, he's good. He probably doesn't because you got to pay a little more. I think. Well, and most that people, was, uh, I think he said his car is an older vehicle. I got to tell you, uh, a lot of people with older cars or trucks aren't likely to carry that type of insurance because, yes, there is an extra monthly or quarterly cost with the insurance. And then you think, who in their right mind would vandalize my my car? You think most likely that a car that's a late model car uh, and parked in vulnerable places would be targeted by vandals. You would never in a million years think that an older car like that would have been keyed, especially parked as he went over to the St. Mary's Festival. Yeah, I looked for him there. I couldn't find him. I want to talk to him about that Charlotte Street thing. Yeah. Hey, but I really wanted to say, Bob, when I called this morning, that you are my favorite conservative talk show host. And if anybody else thinks you're not, then they're deceived. And everybody loves you. I would say, and this is, with, this is not an ego thing, but I would say uh, when it comes to perhaps the most beloved and the most articulate and sometimes even the funniest, conservative talk show host in the nation, certainly after we lost Rush, I'm, I'm glad to carry the torch, to carry on what uh, the iconic Rush Limbaugh began, even though I am not fit to even carry Rush Limbaugh's microphone or even come into the same room as the golden EIB mic. And I've listened to you longer than any of these listeners who are on it, as far as I know, I, I know for sure, because for them to think that you're anything but you know, then I don't. And they gave See? me the key to the city, and I remember that you got the That's key to right. the city. That's right. And and how many other talk show hosts? I have two, not one, but two keys to this great city. How many other talk show hosts ever got two keys to the city? Pro life is the way to go, my friend. That's okay, it. I appreciate your call. This is Bob Joseph, serving all of Binghamton and beyond. 
I don't have a golden microphone, and I can only aspire to do one-tenth of the job that the magnificent El Rushbo did for so many decades here at WNBF. It's 1028. Good morning, you're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Hi, uh, this is Dan from Binghamton. Good morning, Bob. Morning. Hey, uh, last night I, w- I was listening to, uh, I, I don't know, I think it was one of NBC, somebody, and they had these uh, governors, senators, and people on from Arizona, and I didn't, I wasn't even aware of it, although I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see it, uh, is these people, they're called Republicans for Harris, and it's sweeping the nation. And it's really, you know, because that's the way I felt about it. At one time, I was a Republican, and of course, I'm not anymore. But uh, in that sense, you know, they don't they don't have anybody to run for president. That's when I got out of it. I just said, there's no way that I can possibly hitch my wagon to Donald Trump in that, the, what do they call him, the buffoon and the hillbilly. Oh, be kind. Don't don't take the low road about J.D. Vance. If you want to, if you want to um, disagree with Mr. Vance on issues, that's one thing. But this is not this is not the Twitterverse or or social media. So let's let's keep those kinds of attacks. I, I know we can't eliminate them completely. Let's try to avoid them and and focus on issues. I mean, if you have specific issues regarding. The um, Republican or Democratic candidates discuss those, but you know, let's try to minimize the the meanness. We don't, you know, the world is too mean as it is. I would draw the hillbilly. Thank you. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with hillbillies. I mean, the Beverly Hillbillies certainly for many TV seasons in the '60s were among the highest rated and and most beloved. TV characters, so it's not necessarily meant to be denigrating, but a lot of times people use the term hillbilly or hillbillies in a way that that carries negative connotations. All I can say is thanks for straightening me out on that. And I just wanted to reiterate the part where I really thought that this was going to come about this Republican uh, for Harris because you know, there's really nobody running as a, on a Republican ticket. I started, now, Donald had, what do you have, 62 lies in, in uh, 45 minutes the other day. And they said, they said that it broke down to two lies per minute. I mean, I don't, I don't understand how people can really think seriously that Trump can proceed. It's just incredible. To me. Well, you know, to me, I think it's fascinating. I'm I have to say, even though we're now less than three months away from the election, I, I find the situation that we're now in to be unusual, interesting, exciting. It's every day. I look forward to it, the, the, the new, the new allegations, the new shocks, the new twists, the new turns. Not so much because it's something that we used to see. It's just, it's the way things are done in 2024. So I accept it. Right. And you know, that part where he said he didn't, or he went down in a helicopter with Billy Brown. I mean, that was incredible. But like you said, I mean, maybe he has to do that. Maybe that's his way of thinking, well, I, I, they had a psychiatrist kind of critique those words. And he said that, said that it was a, a narcissistic breakdown that he wasn't getting enough attention. So we had to make up that story about going down in a helicopter with well, somebody that... you know, at, at least he wasn't in a boat and worried about uh, uh, sharks and uh, electricity. So, I mean, I, I would say in, in some in some ways, it's it's a sign of progress. Yeah, the helicopter was pretty dramatic. I thought that was <laughs> nice. Well, you know, it would have been funny it, now with AI... It would have been funny if the campaign had put out a 30-second or a 60-second ad using the beauty of AI and uh, computer-generated graphics to sort of illustrate what that flight may have been like. Yeah, I know. It's a missed opportunity. I mean, they can still do it. They can still do it, but now if they do it, 
they're going to run the risk of me saying, oh, you stole my idea because I just put it out there and they haven't done it yet. So if that shows up uh, on, on one of the um, campaign platforms today or tomorrow, then I can say with uh, great authority that they're simply they're so desperate that they're at the point of copying a, an upstate New York radio host. Yeah, right. And then then you got to you got to look at the Martin Luther King uh, crowd compared to Trump's crowd when he said that. I mean, you got to I mean, he's really as what is what do they call him unhinged. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but I have heard some people say that. Appreciate your call. More calls are coming up 607-772-1290. Stay tuned to WNBF wnbf.com 92.1 fm 1290 am and be sure to have the app on your phone do you have the wnbf app on your phone you should if you don't download it now it's free 607-772-1290 and the lines suddenly are lighting up bill from binghamton you're on the air course there still may be some water in the lines hi wnbf you're on the air what's your first name where you're calling from yeah hi there bob it's uh, dave from vestal how's it going never better loving life good 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 yeah i'm, a, I'm on the move i hope you can hear me um uh yeah i was listening uh i was trying to pay attention uh lots of laughs bob uh you know the Democrats could right now have a goat running for president and all these Trump haters be calling in saying, vote for the goat. <laughs> well, some would say Kamala Harris is the greatest of all time. <laughs> yeah, Bob. Uh, by the way, you always bring up that Billy Bush tape, which I think is most appropriately named. Um, you know, in a couple months ago, Bob, remember I called in and, and I issued a challenge, and it was during the Trump's uh, trials there, when he was uh, on trial. And I challenged anyone to call in and admit, even though they, an anti-Trumper, admit that they were stacking everything against them in the court cases. And then we had one gentleman that had, was brave, brave enough to call in and admit it. Now, I'd like to issue one more challenge, Bob. Even though you can't stand Trump, don't want him as president, can you at least one person call in and admit that Harris is one of the one of the most terrible candidates ever brought before this country? Because it's not true. You may say she's one of the worst candidates in your lifetime, and I'm not going to get into some sort of argument with you about that because I can't. I, I can't and I don't hope to sway you, but in the colorful history of the United States of America, dating back more than two centuries, I guarantee you there have been some other candidates that are not even not even in the same bar, ballpark. So, you know, you, you are safe in your opinion about Kamala Harris. Obviously, tens of millions of other Americans have a different opinion, but... You're entitled to your opinion. But as far as historically, I would say if, if you did your research, you could find at least one candidate for president who hasn't been quite as qualified or quite as dignified. And quite as stupid. Don't forget that. Prefer to, for you to avoid the word. I prefer not to hear that word on, on the radio, not on this program. This is a family program. Okay, Bob. Hey, but you know... <laughs> Bob, she, how do you win copying the other guy's policies? That's not what do you mean? So this is something, this is called a catch-22. So Kamala Harris would be roundly criticized by her opponent if she had a policy, if she said, I want to continue taxing tips, or even better, I want to double the tax on tips. So that would be criticized by her opponent. Now that she says that she wants to remove the tax on tips, she's being roundly criticized by her opponent. That's called a catch-22. And as I said on Monday's great program, the idea 
of eliminating the tax on tips is not unique to the Republican candidate. He did not invent the idea. So just because somebody says, that'd be like, oh, say the Republican candidate saying, I support sunny days in Binghamton and days with humidity under 90% in August. I support that. And then Kamala Harris says the same thing, which is common sense. And then the next day, the Republican candidate would say, look, she's copying me. She doesn't have any original ideas. No, when you state something that you know is popular among some voters that you need, it's not, don't say you're going to copy someone. Say, and she should have said, she, it would have been nice, actually, if she put it this way, when she announced that, when she was in Nevada talking to those workers, it would have been actually nice for her to acknowledge, my opponent has said he supports eliminating the tax on tips. And I agree with my opponent. That would have been a nice way. And then that would have taken, taken away some of the ammunition that her opponent thinks he has. Bob, I take my cues from your show, and, and, and that's why I, I know she's a bad candidate, because you have callers that call in all the time that I don't agree with, but I respect. And I respect their opinions. And these certain people are not calling in raving about that genius at all. They're just... Well, maybe there's water in the lines. We've had problems over the last several days because of all the storms. Maybe there are water. There are waters in the lines. And maybe, maybe it'll take another couple of days before their phones work again. <laughs> I don't know. The bottom line is, by, by the way, this issue about taxing tips, it's a nothing burger. It means nothing to most voters. And I think, as I mentioned on Monday, it's, it's probably not a, anything that's going to be acted on anyway. I mean, a lot of taxes, a lot of taxable tip income never gets reported anyway because it's all, not all, because in many cases it's cash, so it's untraceable. So I think of all the issues, if, it, if this is the issue that the Republican candidate thinks is going to win him another four years in public housing, I, I have some guidance for him. It's not going to work, buddy. I, I agree with you, Bob. Uh, and you know, talk about a nothing burger. You could go over to the McDonald's on Main Street, and for $1.99, they would give you one of these, a big nothing burger with special sauce. It will help. It will help with the people that are honest with their taxes. <laughs> so, in other words, it's not going to apply to billionaires. <laughs> anyway, always... Always a joy. Always a privilege. Thank you. 1043 WNBF. Good morning. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Jim from Owego. Morning, uh, Jim. I just caught I just caught a little bit of the uh, previous discussion, not the whole thing, so hopefully I'm not repeating. But the one thing I think we're missing with Kamala Harris with the tips thing is that she introduced, she was the tie-breaking vote that installed that policy to begin with. Um she, and the, the vote that added uh, the uh, 180,000 IRS agents, that is one of the, one of the um, things that were, were in the bill. So she, she's the one that started that whole process of taxing the tips. And now she's, of course, it's become popular and she wants to pander to that uh, union. Now she's, she's saying that, that she wants to do that. But that's all I wanted to share. Okay. I appreciate it. Hope you have a great day. Yes. Yeah. 1044 at WNBF. Everybody, everybody is invited to call this program every day, once, every day, between now and the end of time. Everybody is invited to call this program once, 607-772-1290. Or, for that matter, you can call using the free WNBF app, as was quite appropriately demonstrated earlier this hour by my colleague Don Morgan in what was designed to appear as a spontaneous call when in fact it was clearly a setup. Even I suspected that Don from Binghamton was my colleague who's on before the program. 
I thought the voice sounded familiar. I thought so. 92.1 FM, 1290 AM, streaming at WNBF.com. Williams are now moving forward, as only I can do. <laughs> it's only, yes, it's up to me to make it happen. And that's because I'm the only one here at the studio. Does it, does it make a difference? Is there really a producer? Is there a researcher? Is there a counselor? <laughs> An editor? No. This is it, folks. This is what it's come down to in uh, 2024. A show like no other. That's why, that's why it's different from all the rest. All the other shows have uh, producers and researchers and directors and opinionators and focus groups. This show, this show alone is exactly what America needs more shows just like this, not people. And again, I'm not taking away from all the people who are on the national stage and have all the help in the world because they need all the help in the world. Me, on the other hand, can do it with both hands tied behind my back and my feet in shackles. Can still get it done. The old-fashioned way. Good morning. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Joel from Binghamton. Morning. What's up? First-time caller, but I've been listening forever. Um, I've just been hearing a lot of people in government, including the guy in charge. Uh, they keep saying they're going to make large corporations pay their fair share and make the elite pay their fair share. So my question is, why is that same government the one giving them the low tax rate that they pay? Excellent question. And the other question would be, why would you just start now? Why haven't you been doing it all along? All the people who are talking about making things more equitable and more fair for individual Americans, why haven't you done it up to this point? Oh, exactly. That's you know, why Why do we think that starting January 20th that suddenly everything will, will change the way America is set up to favor businesses against individuals? Why would that suddenly change when the president is sworn in at noon on January 20th? Yep, that's exactly my question. Yeah. But I got to get back to work. I'm going to try to continue to listen today. Thank you. Hope you'll call again. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, first time callers, gotta love them. Thank you. And if you have never called the program before and think today might be a good day to uh, try it out, it's not really, it's not really difficult. Obviously, you have to string together those digits, those 10 digits in the right sequence, 607-772-1290. So that's the hard part. And then just let it ring. Let it ring. Just let it ring. And uh, I think you'll be happy. You'll be happy when you call the program. And even, say, the first time, even if it's just to say hi. Say hi, Bob, just testing to see if, if this thing that you talk about with the simplicity of calling in, if, if it's really that simple. And... It really is. It is that simple. You're at News Radio, WNBF, WNBF.com, with the local news you like, including more information about the apartments. Wow, I want to move to the mall. Imagine living near the mall, living at the mall, at the new apartment complex with all those apartments. Now take a look, WNBF.com, Oakdale Commons expansion with a housing complex and child care center. That is incredible. That is incredible. Except it's reality. Hi, WNBF, you're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? 
John from Binghamton. I just have a quick question. Yeah, you're Let's not the you're about. not the John from the Binghamton Plaza, are you? I I am, but it's a different question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, we're still waiting for all the legal stuff to go through, and I'm going to let you know first firsthand. Um, my question is: people not want to pay tax on their tips. What happens when they retire and their Social Security is nothing? They didn't pay into Social Security. What are they going to do when they retire if they're not paying taxes when they get such a low wage now? They can live in a van by the river. Right. So if they're not paying taxes on that extra income, they're going to suffer bad when they in retirement time. Yep. All right. All right. That's my question. Okay. <laughs> That's a good point. Thank you, John from Binghamton. Here's an interesting story that I just spotted on AP because they just pushed it out this morning, says um, the two candidates agree on one thing, at least. They both claim they want to eliminate federal taxes on workers' tips, but experts say there's a reason Congress hasn't made such a change already. It would be complicated, not to mention enormously costly to the federal government. It would encourage many higher-paid workers to restructure their compensation to classify some of it as tips and thereby avoid taxes. In the end, it likely would not help millions of low-income workers. A guy who is a professor of law and economics at the University of Michigan said, there's no way that it wouldn't be a mess. See, that's what I was thinking. I don't think I was as blunt as that, but it would be a mess. It'd be a big fill-in-the-blank mess. So the candidates unveiled their tip plans, uh, or tax-free tips in Nevada. Details sparse, of course. Why would they give details for something that is unrealistic? Uh, Harris's campaign said she would work with Congress to come up with a proposal and blah, blah, woof, woof. So the professor at the University of Michigan suggested millions of workers, not just wealthy ones, would seek to change their compensation to include tips and could even do so legally. And then he explains how it could be done. So in the end, it would cause a substantial loss of revenue for the federal government. And remember... As difficult a concept as this may be for some people to grasp, if the federal government or state government or even your local government, like the town of Vestal, if they lose revenue from one source, they're going to have to make it up some other way. So don't think for a minute, ultimately, that say, okay, we eliminate taxes on tips. Everybody wins. No. Perhaps the people who are most clever, who have the best tax advisor, will save big because they'll figure a way to use the change in the tax law to their advantage. And then the rest of us wind up having to make up for the lost revenue. And then people will call in here to the Binghamton Now studio to complain to me about how other taxes went up, how income taxes went up, or whatever. So it's not going to be revenue neutral. And again, it probably wouldn't happen anyway. You know, this is, this is yet another illustration of candidates who talk big during an election in a desperate bid to gain a few votes in a critical state, knowing full well, even if they pushed for this, even if either of these candidates, the Democratic candidate or Republican candidate, I mean, obviously it appears one or the other, probably win, unless it really is rigged. And that'd be funny. November 7th. Well, isn't this a surprise? It's actually RFK Jr. who won. Well, then, if that happens, then I could see millions of Americans questioning the propriety of, of the process. The bottom line... One of the candidates, one either the Republican or Democratic candidate, will win. And then, when they're president, starting January 20th, they'll promptly forget almost everything they said during the campaign. Because that's how it works. That's how campaigns work. Everybody talks big. You promise the world. And then, after you're elected... 
You stop doing interviews, you stop doing news conferences, and you ignore essentially 98%, maybe 99% of the things you promise to do. Because you know, people have short memories, and you know. In the end, people don't care, and most people don't expect candidates to follow through on any of their promises. This is Bob Joseph Live, serving America with... An unexpected dose of honesty. Binghamton Now, WNBF, WNBF.com. Joining us now in the Binghamton Now studio in downtown Binghamton is Rick Marcy. Familiar name to many, many newspaper readers here in Binghamton and beyond. Rick, it's good to have you with us on WNBF. It's good to be here, Bob. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And... I uh, was really shocked and disappointed a few days ago to learn, shortly after you learned, that the Great Outdoors column that's been a fixture in the Press and Sun Bulletin for a long time no longer will appear in our Gannett paper. That is true. Uh, I've been waiting for that pink slip for quite a long time, given the state of local newspapers, so it wasn't a total shock. And uh, I'd like to think there's a silver lining in all that. I did this uh, weekly column thing for 44 years. And the, the idea that Gannett paid me to write a weekly column for 44 years makes it kind of hard for me to, you know, get too PO'd about the state of things. And I'm moving on. Well, and in, in fairness, 44 years is a really good run in the media whether it's newspapers, radio, TV, or in any business. Anybody who is able to stick around for three or four or more decades obviously is doing something right. Um, I think what I was doing right was uh, writing good columns. Otherwise, I'd have been long gone years ago. Tell us how it got started, because I, I get the sense that uh, from a very, very early age, you had a real interest in nature, and I get a sense that's in large part thanks to your mom, Harriet. Yeah, I had a nature mother. Uh, she was absolutely a crazed nature mother, and this was in the mid-50s and, and uh, 60s when uh, environmental people were, were uh, few and far between. But for some reason, my mom caught the bug, and uh, so I lived around this person who was uh, just obsessed with all good things involved with nature. She loved birds. She was a bird watcher and lady bird watchers got made fun of in those days. And then uh, she mastered all the birds. She knew all the birds and she knew all the bird songs. And then she decided she would uh, study butterflies. So she learned all the butterflies. And, uh, and then she, after she knew all the butterflies, she got to know all the dragonflies. And so I was around that. And through, through the process of osmosis, I went from a teenager who didn't care to, to a college student who didn't care to a college graduate who suddenly did care. What was your first full-time job? It was a feature writer and nature columnist for the Evening Press in 1980. I got hired uh, as a full-timer. And I wrote feature stories, and I wrote this weekly column. I started this weekly column in April of 1980. So 44 years ago, and I read even before you started the column, one great feature that the newspaper did, there was a, a Sunday profile of you, I think a few years earlier, about your love for nature. And that's back when the Sunday newspaper had its own weekly magazine, Susquehanna, and it was a, a great feature about you and your love for neat nature. And it also included, I think, a couple of pages um, written by you and also with some beautiful illustrations by someone you love. Bob, if you haven't recently done any research, you got a pretty darn good memory. Yeah. No, it's recent research. <laughs> I, I yeah. did that about a week ago. Yeah. And I, I, it, it jogged my memory. I had sort of remembered that. And then when I, I said, oh, here's the Rick story. And then a Rick Marcy contribution, and then look what Jan Marcy did. Yeah, we have to we have to remember that uh, in 1980, uh, the Evening Press had a daily circulation of 70,000, 
and a, and a Sunday circulation of 90,000. Every house had a box that the paper went into, so the, uh, the, the readership was, uh, was substantial. I worked in the 70s for a Broome County Parks Department. You As were a, a naturist. Yeah, I was a naturalist. I went to schools. I, I took the kids out to Greenwood Park and Dorchester, and I took them on nature walks. And uh, a, a friend of mine at the press, Jeff Davis, uh, he was writing for the paper then, did a, did a feature extended feature on on ranger rick and i enjoyed that yeah and yes it was recent research to yeah. say okay that that helps me to remember sort of how it got started because i was looking forward to the opportunity to chat with you not just about what happened most recently but also the the work and the love and the educating that you've done in this area for about four and a half decades. So many people that were touched, whether it was through the newspaper column or educating young people while working for Broome County. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i grateful for the opportunity to have done that and uh, influence, I hope, a whole lot of people to appreciate the natural world more than they would have had I not been around. Speaking with Rick Marcy who for well over four decades wrote the Great Outdoors column for the Press and Sun Bulletin. And you alluded to the way things were, say, back in the 70s and 80s. Everything, of course, the traditional media landscape is completely different now than it was before the Internet. And so that affects whether it's print newspapers or terrestrial radio stations or even TV stations. Everything has undergone a dramatic change, and we're all touched by it, both people within the media business and also for news consumers and people who enjoy information about topics like nature. Everybody is touched by it, and there are some good things and bad things. Obviously, as as jobs are lost from the traditional media, it affects individuals and families, but there are also opportunities, too. And one thing that you have done since learning that the great outdoors will no longer appear in the Binghamton paper and online, you actually are, are taking advantage of this opportunity to reach out to people who've enjoyed your writing. Yeah, it's a silver lining. It's a new start for me. I'm excited about it. What I've done is I've created a, an email, uh, a nature report, Ranger Rick's nature report. I got the name Ranger Rick because I was working at, the, at, a, at a park as a naturalist. Uh, and I wore the silly uh, Smoky Bear Ranger hat and it stuck. So it's called Ranger Rick's uh, nature report. And it's an email weekly report. And uh, we'll, I'll give you my email address later. You just need to email me to get on the list. And it will include a weekly column, fresh baked, uh, a beautiful, uh, large format, high definition color photograph, which in the paper was very uh, much the opposite of that. And other features. I've got one called Traveler's Moment where I go back and I've had a chance. I was in the nature travel business for a long time as well. As a sideline, I got a chance to go all sorts of places taking people around. Traveler's Moment uh, captures one of those rare moments. Your first wild tiger or in, encountering, uh, you know, a 12-foot alligator, that, that sort of stuff uh, with photos. Then there's a diary entry, whatever the date that the... Uh, Report comes out, I look, I've look. i got diary entries for the past 25 years. So I'll go back, for example, on April, uh, August 13th, and I'll look at August 13th all the way back to 2000 and pick out one particular August 13th that I thought was really interesting, that I saw something interesting, and include that. So there's m a lot more content and the photos, and I'm uh, proud of my photography. I've been doing it forever. Uh, are bigger and better. So it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, an improvement and a silver lining. Speaking with Rick Marcy here on WNBF on this Tuesday morning, one thing that I've always wanted to talk with you uh, a little bit about uh, over the years was the, the work that your mom did along with a good friend that, that made a big difference in Tioga County. Some people call it the Appalachian Marsh. Others know it as Harriet's Marsh. And I'm looking now at at the story where even the New York Times, just over 25 years ago, 
focused on what was at the time a, a rare success story where people who were concerned about the environment were actually able to effectively not just fight City Hall, but fight the the state DOT with the original design plans for the Route 17 Expressway. And thanks to every time I drive through that area between Apple Lake and Owego, I always think of your mother, who I never had the chance to meet, but always thought, well, that shows how the power of uh, one or two or a small group of people can have um, a permanent impact. I think it was about 1965 when they were going to build Route 17, and uh, my mother had been going to this marsh. Currently, the marsh is right across Route 17 from Hiawatha Landing Golf Course. Uh, And my mother had been going there for uh, many years, bird watching with her friend Florence. And one day she went there, and there were flags right through the middle of the marsh, and uh, there was a, a DOT. Uh, truck there and my mother asked what was going on and was informed they were going to build the the new road right through the marsh. She went uh, a little uh, berserk and and, uh, the bottom line is over the next uh, year or so she uh, 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 bothered the DOT to the point where they finally sent an engineer down to the marsh to meet her and uh, when she met him, she said, you know, it, it, it just doesn't make sense to build a, a road uh, in, a, in a mucky, marshy uh, uh, roadbed environment. Why don't you look up there? There's the railroad tracks. Why don't you build it up there? And the guy said, lady, I didn't come here to hear what you had to say. Uh, I came here to tell you what we're, what we're going to do. And my mom remembers that her blood just sort of sort of started to boil and keep in mind this is the 1965 women's lib hadn't been invented but she just uh started uh, shouting back at the guy that this was irresponsible etc uh, uh, six weeks later she goes to the marsh and uh she notes that the flags have gone away in the middle of the marsh and there's a bulldozer up on the railroad tracks and she goes up there and her you know uh knee high rubber boots and her her silly hat and uh there's a guy in the bulldozer and he he she said he was a very nice young fellow and he actually even turned his machine off to talk to me and i said hey what's going on sir uh i thought the, they were going to build the marsh through the, the the road through the marsh and he said lady everybody knows you don't build a highway through a marsh and she had won she had convinced the dot to build the road where it currently stands so i call it harriet's marsh I call it that too, and I I enjoy visiting occasionally, not as often as I ought to, but no matter what the season, it's beautiful. There's news on that, Bob, that uh, people should know about. There was a blind at the marsh that was beautifully positioned uh, uh, to look out at, at the marsh. A blind is a hide, really, where you can sit and look through uh, slotted windows and the, and the, the waterfall, etc. The herons don't see you. It had fallen into disrepair, but fortunately, uh, it is now being uh, replaced by a brand new uh, blind that will be in position on Friday the 23rd and probably will be open uh, to the public after that. So we're very excited about that. Oh, that is good news. I had heard that was probably going to happen. So thank you for the update and the confirmation. Can I bother you with one more thing about Harriet? Yes. She, uh, uh, WSKG was going to do a retrospect on Route 17, like 50 years after the the fact. And my mom was still alive. And so uh, Bill Jaker of WSKG came over to my house and Harriet came up to my my place and uh, they videotaped Harriet telling the story uh, of how she did this. And she was probably 87 or 88 at the time, but very together, very sharp. And that video is available. Uh, Waterman Conservation Center in Appalachian administers the marsh, which is in per- perpetuity uh, preserved uh, and, and, and protected by them. And they have a uh, YouTube channel on which if you go to Waterman on YouTube, you can watch Harriet 
to uh, tell the story that I told much better than I did. And I just punched it up. If you want to find it fast on YouTube, just punch in Harriet Marcy and WSKG. I'm looking at you and your mom, and I believe uh, it's, it looks like it runs a little over 22 minutes. I've listened to it. It's a wonderful story to hear it in your mom's own words. They, I think, ha also have a shortened version of it, like the highlights. But I'd recommend you go for the full shot. I'd say it's worth it's worth 22. She was a pioneer. It's worth 22 minutes, 22 minutes to hear the story. It's a compelling story, and it's a story I think even kids ought to hear. As, as you learn about what you can conceivably do to make a difference in the world. Rick Marcy, what's the email address if people would like to get on the, the list to um, receive the, the weekly updates in your new column? It's uh, uh, if you if you have us, uh, you know, the standard Roadrunner email address, it, my R Marcy, it's M-A-R-S-I at S-T-N-Y dot R-R dot com. Rick Marcy, I'm glad that we finally had a chance to have you on the program. Wish you continued success as you embark on this new chapter of educating and informing people. Send me an email, folks. Get on the list. You'll like Ranger Rick's report. Thank you, Bob. It's 1127. We're live and local on a Tuesday morning. This is Binghamton Now on WNBF. 607-772-1290 is the number if you'd like to talk. Yes, we like to talk. That's why we have a talk show. <laughs> People say... But, Bob, do you ever get sick of talking? Mm, no, even when I'm sick, I'm not sick of talking. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, even, even that week that uh, I was forced to do the program from home, from the home studio, because of COVID... I may have been sick of COVID. I may have been running a fever. Wasn't sick of talking. No, for me, talk is, is therapeutic. <laughs> and yes, I talk in my sleep. <laughs> Someday I'll, I'll record that so you can think sometimes that would make for a better listening experience. All right, let's do the forecast because they want us to use the forecast deck. From the forecast deck, here we go. Mostly sunny today, high 77, mainly clear tonight, low 56. Sunny tomorrow, isolated showers in the afternoon, maybe a thunderstorm, high 79. And sunny on Thursday with a slight chance of afternoon showers and thunderstorms, high 83. Right now it's... 74 in downtown Binghamton. That's 23 Celsius. Good news radio, WNBF. If you have stuff to say, uh, it could be about local things. What about your higher property taxes? Do you think your property taxes should, sh should soar to astronomical levels? Is that what America is about? Ever higher property taxes to support your favorite governmental services. Hey, if that's what you want, that's what you're going to get. Don't, just because it's not being covered on the front page of the paper or on all the newscasts, don't think for a minute that they're going to approve a big tax cut. Wouldn't that be funny? Today, the town board approved a big tax cut. Yeah, it's not going to happen. 11.36. News Radio, WNBF, WNBF.com. This is interesting. This is according to Spectrum News. Kevin Fry reports on Spectrum News. A Republican congresswoman, a former member of Congress from Staten Island, which, of course, is... 
filled with Republicans, is crossing party lines to back Kamala Harris, the Democrat for president, Susan Molinari, told Spectrum News she believes Harris is smart, strong, and knows how to handle herself on the world stage, and she added she's not crazy. Molinari is part of a new Republicans for Harris coalition. They say it's an effort to reach out to disaffected members of the GOP who, like her, may not agree with everything Democrats stand for policy-wise but view the former guy as a volatile threat. Molinari, whose father Guy served as congressman and later Staten Island, Staten Island Borough President, argues her announcement should be viewed as both an endorsement of Harris and an endorsement against the former Guy. In 2020, she also broke with her party, throwing her support behind that guy from Scranton, Joe Biden. Addressing the Democratic National Convention that year alongside other Republicans, she said she had known the GOP candidate for most of her political career. And she said, so disappointing and lately so disturbing. Four years later, Molinari said she stands by the endorsement arguing that guy's recent actions have only reinforced her decision. Hmm. All right, well, she has every right. She has every right to endorse whichever candidate she thinks is not crazy. It's 1138 at News Radio, WNBF. Of course... When we hear about Democrats for Trump, that coalition will update you on who they're endorsing, because that would only be fair. Remember, WNBF's app is where it's at, baby. So if you want to stay connected, not only with this program, but First Knows Binghamton and all the other fine programming on your favorite radio station, Download the app. You can also check out the Seize the Deal store, as well as 5050 Friday podcasts. Oh, and information about our upcoming job fair. The job fair will be happening next week, a week from tomorrow. The Town Square Media Job Fair at the Broome County Regional Farmers Market on Upper Front Street. It's going to be August 21st from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And it will be your chance to connect with local businesses and organizations ready to hire. So be sure to bring your resume and seize the opportunity. If you're looking for a new job, a lot of people will be looking for new team members, including Good Shepherd and Willow Run Foods. If you want more information about the job fair coming up next week. Take a look on our website, wnbf.com. It's 1140. This is Bob Joseph. We'll be taking more calls between now and noon on Binghamton Now. Let's take some more calls at 1143. As long as the lines hold out. John in Binghamton, good morning. You're on the air. Uh, good morning. I just wanted to call to counter what uh, that woman called Bonnie uh, called about and um, asking uh, where did she come up with the information about Kamala Harris, that she's done things, that she's supposed to be intelligent, that she's the God, you know God's gift to the presidency. Um, she certainly wasn't God's gift to the vice presidency. Uh, she has done virtually nothing except lay back and watch the decline of the president and say nothing. And she said nothing really except word salads about anything. Well, I have to ask you, Paul, excuse me, John, sorry, Paul's coming up. John, I have to ask you, what exactly was Kamala Harris supposed to say? What exactly was she supposed to say? Uh, well, she should. Look, you see your boss say you're working and you see your boss is not as sharp as he once was. So what are you supposed to do about that? Tell the people. No, you can't. What are you, nuts? <laughs> Get real. Have you ever worked 
okay? Have you ever worked in your life? Who do you think you're talking to anyway? I don't know. I'm asking you a serious question. So, okay, I take the answer is yes. You've worked in your life. Did you ever have a boss? Do you think it's fair to run a collar down like that? Have I ever worked in my life? I asked a question. It's not running you down. So, okay, I'll cut right to the chase. So, in the past, when you had a boss, would you go public and say, my boss is losing it? You sat there and called me nuts before you said that. All right. I didn't call you nuts. Yes, you did. Well, if you think I did, it's my mistake. You're absolutely positively not nuts. So sorry if that's if that's what you heard. That's not what I meant. So, so I want to tell you. No, I want to ask you. Now, ask answer the question. If you had a boss who was not not doing the job well and was starting to lose it, would you go public and start telling people my boss is starting to lose it? If he's the boss of all the people, which uh, the president is, yes. All right. Thank you. And thank you for your call, John. Paul from West Windsor, you're on the air. Bob, I want to talk about uh, the size of government. And I'm 76, and before I leave this world, I'm hoping that uh, we can make the United States better. The size of government is getting out of control, I think. It costs a lot of money to run this government, and it's getting bigger. So uh, don't we need somebody that will help us control the size of government? Sure. And who, who do you suggest will do that? I don't know. Everybody's listening to what the candidates are saying. Is there somebody out there who can uh, reduce the size of government? Because I'm 76, and when I leave this world, I'm afraid that the government's going to get so big that we can't even handle it. Because they don't make money. They take the money to run it, and it gets bigger, and it costs more. Yeah, I'm with you, man. But, but trust me, the two major party candidates for president aren't going to reduce the size of government in the next four years. There's well, a news There's a news some flash. Of, some of them are talking about sending back things to the state, which the Constitution provided. And I think that's probably a good idea because the federal government is our problem, not, not so much the state governments. But uh, I think the sending some of this stuff back to the states, like uh, one of the candidates said, uh, about education, he said something about that, sending it back to the states. Yeah, why didn't he do it when he had the chance? I, which candidate was that, the former guy? Yeah, the former guy was talking about, I believe, during his uh, technically um, plagued and long-delayed interview last night online, I believe he made some kind of comment about shutting down the education department and turning over the responsibilities for education to the individual states. So my question is, he had four years to do it. Why didn't he? Well, I think he had a lot of problems in his administration that prevented him from doing that. It was a lot of I don't believe that for a second. Yes, I, I believe with part of your statement, he had a lot of problems in his administration, including a lot of problems with keeping people uh, working for him because a lot of people, uh, certainly in the early days, took jobs with the new administration, and then they either quit or were fired. So, yeah, he, he definitely had a problem-plagued administration, but there was nothing that stood in the way of any effort to dismantle the Department of Education. He could have tried, and I don't recall him doing that. Well, I, I didn't mean to bring the former guy into this. Uh, what I'm talking about is uh, I think our, our listeners should be concerned about the size of government and it's going to get too big and it's going to swallow us all up. I don't disagree. You and I agree on that. So uh, I'm with you, man. Let's have the custom, your listeners think about who will help us do that. All right. The size of government. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Paul. Bob. Yep. No, I uh, I fully agree. Government is uh, the size of government. Federal government is is too big, and steps need to be taken to try to make thoughtful cuts in in government. And 
I know some people are going to say, but Bob, you, as the preeminent conservative talk show host, you are talking about cutting government waste? Yes. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Cut government waste, especially in places like Albany and D.C. It's 1150 at WNBF. Good morning. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Hey, good morning, Bob. This is Vinny from Binghamton. All right. Hey, listen, I heard a couple callers ago was talking about uh, people um, talking about their boss, and uh, they owed it to the American people if uh, their boss, being the president, there was something wrong with him. Well, I wanted to ask that caller, uh, Nikki Haley. <laughs> she talked about her boss. He was in the uh, uh, Trump administration. Said the, and she, you heard what she said. He, he is not fit to be the president. Chris Christie. He was a consultant. In that administration, he told you, too, this guy's no good. He shouldn't even be there. And guess what? The vice president of the United States, Donald Trump's man right next to him, told you he was wrong. He's unfit. Wait a second. Are you trying to actually put on the record on this program public-facing statements that were made by people who knew Donald Trump the best? Yeah, that's why he didn't go into the uh, Republican debate. He was missing. Don't you remember? This great leader of yours, Donald Trump, he didn't even go to the Republican debate because all those people that worked for him were going to cut him up. And he knew it. So he took off. So does that change your idea of Donald Trump? I hear you talking about Kamala Harris. She hasn't done anything. This guy hasn't done anything. He could even show up to his own debate, his own party's debate. And now he's up there doing all this. I mean. You, you you see, I don't even like you really talking about him, Bob, because he's he's like an afterthought right now. He is so unfit. You just see him. He's the whole thing with Brown and oh yeah, I was on the helicopter. It is just, just it, it's right there on the table. This guy is it, no, his days are over. Now here's the thing: when Kamala Harris wins, where's the Republican Party going? Who's going to be your new leader? Because you, so, you slowly see all these Republicans come, well, we're going to go from Kamala Harris. I think they see the writing on the wall. Where are we going to go after November, after the election? Because Trump will be like 110. So where are we going to go? J.D. Vance. J.D. Vance, oh, 2028. God, Bob. <laughs> he, he, no, no, he's not going anywhere. He'll go right back to wherever he was. All right. Nah, no. He, no. No, he's no. got a he's got a bright future with the grand old party. Mm, no. Hey, I, I real quick, did you see um the former governor of there in Minnesota, Jesse Ventura talking about that uh, whole thing of them getting after uh Walt for the uh being in the reserves? I had forgotten about that. Jesse said, "No, what you should be talking about is during the war in Iraq, we were running out of bodies. So he did an executive order. George Bush did an executive order and sent some of our National Guard over there. He goes, those National Guard are supposed to be over there in that type of war. They're supposed to be here, just what their name says. The National Guard. They are here to protect our nation here, not over there in the war. And I guess at the time, Waltz had been there for 24 years already. So... They, they started doing that. He said, listen, I'm going to run for Congress. What's wrong with that? I served my National Guard, what they're supposed to do, over in this country for that long. You've got to see it because he goes into more detail. That, that, that's his expertise. Yeah, I'm looking now at, uh, at some of the quotes from the TV interview. And here's a quote from Jesse Ventura. And I remember him. I always thought a lot of Jesse Ventura when he mm -hmm. was the independent Minnesota governor, he said, I think Vance is doing a disservice to the Marine Corps because I know a lot of great Marines and Marines show respect. He said, that's the one thing you get out of a Marine is respect and Vance ought to look in the mirror and behave like a Marine. Yeah. It said, Walls yep. served more than two decades in the Army National Guard. Vance served in the Marines. And uh, as you pointed out, Vance has been going after Tim Wall's record, and it's it's unseemly. This is just not done. Yeah. This yeah. is not done. I mean, I could see talk show hosts, because that's what talk show hosts do.
because they're on the air and they have to fill air time. So I could see Dan Bongino or Sean Hannity or Mark Levin or other talk show hosts talking about the military record of Tim Walsh. J.D. Vance, as a military man himself, that's not done. In my opinion, yeah. that's what I've heard. I am not. Yeah. I'll be the first to stipulate I have never served in the military. So let that be perfectly clear so people who are calling, you know, in with pot shots and, and trying to attack me, I admit I never served in the U.S. military. Perhaps I should have, but I respect those men and women who are, have served our country proudly. Yes. Well, you know what else uh, Jesse said? He said, as soon as uh, Walsh won the governorship, he called Jesse up. He called Jesse up and he said, and he said, tried to pick in his brain. Hey, man, when you were here, what did you do? Because I think when you won it, you know, you did a lot of good things for this, for this uh, state. How did you do this? What about that? Well, and, and Jesse thought that was so great. He goes, here I am, independent. I win it. And he calls me asking, hey, how did I do this? How did he goes, because it was about the people. He says, I could care less about the party. He goes, it was about the people. So he's got a lot of respect for this guy. But, yeah, you start talking that stuff, boy, that military, he, he knows. He knows. He, he, uh, it was good. It was really good. All right. Well, I'll, I'll see if I can dig up the actual interview. Thanks for not only for calling it to my attention, but also for calling it to the attention of the great North American viewing audience. Yeah, you're welcome, Bob. You're welcome. Thank you, Vinny. Yeah, I, I had not seen it. I admit, I guess I was enjoying the weekend too much to be watching political interviews on my TV. But I, I may look that up to see more about what Jesse Ventura had to say during that televised interview. It sounds, it sounds quite compelling. Well, I think we've all learned a few things today, but that doesn't mean my job here is done. No, I continue on the mission to inform and occasionally entertain and sometimes amuse on Binghamton Now. We'll continue these proceedings tomorrow morning after the 9 o'clock news. Until now, this program is adjourned. I'm Bob Joseph. You're listening to News Radio WNBF and WNBF.com.